welcome everybody to another uh, night in the observatory. Uh, this is Brian Autumn, and uh, tonight we're going to see Orion, my favorite constellation. And uh, the uh, weather is looking pretty good out in the desert, so we're going to be able to see some cool stuff. And um, I think that uh, I just want to quickly tell you a little bit about myself and the telescope. And uh, I'll whip through this quick video because a lot of you have seen it before, but uh, it just kind of gives you a background as to uh, how we came to this place and why um, this weird guy uh, has this telescope in the desert and does all this stuff. But um, the weather looks pretty good out there. And uh, so myself, I saw at the age of 12, I saw one of those blood moon lunar eclipse, and I was totally hooked. So I got a bigger and bigger telescope. I even got a, uh, a dome, as you can see there. And... Uh, it was, it was, I was just hooked, and uh, so I started to take pictures, and I loved uh, taking pictures, and so, but it got worse and worse, so you can see that the light pollution uh, in America is, get, it, like the world, is getting worse and worse and worse. So, um, having a telescope in the backyard was not as fun, so we got to travel to take pictures of Florida, uh, up in Canada, um, a lot of different places to, uh, to really get away from those horrible um, light pollution and so um, it became a problem, so I decided to take what I had in Michigan here and move it all the way across the country to where there was no lights. Take a look down there in the uh, bottom of New Mexico. Nothing. Very dark. And so uh, it became uh, an obsession for me to look at that, and I, and I uh, explored the options. And also, there's another big, big difference. Look how cloudy it is here in Michigan. I mean, it's just a soup all, uh, all winter, and uh, we never see the... See, see the stars in the winter here and down there in the desert. It's called the boot heel of New Mexico. It's clear all the time. So loaded up my stuff, put it in the camper, and drove west, westward ho, and all the way out to the desert to a telescope ranch called Dark Sky New Mexico. And it's a place where there's telescopes. See the square buildings? And uh, they're not domes. They're square buildings. They're cheaper, more efficient. As you can see, uh, it's pretty much a flat valley that we're in there um, with mountains around. The skies are totally clear a lot, a lot of the nights, and uh, th there's no uh, trees to obstruct the view. Our building is the big white one there. The buildings have roofs that slide on rails to, uh, to open up the, um, open the building to the telescope. So it's quite simple, like a garage door, only sideways. The blue telescope the, with red steel at the top of here, you see, belonged to the guy who discovered Pluto, um, Clyde Tombaugh. Kind of cool. So um, here is a, um, uh, the roof um, sliding off, and uh, it's sliding off um, tonight. As you can see, I did this about half an hour ago because you got to let the heat out. Um, so uh, this is what the telescope looks like. Mine's on the left there. And my partners have bigger telescopes there. You can see on the right. Um, ours has three buildings, three telescopes. But what's unusual about mine is it's, I have a very pedestrian telescope, pretty simple. Uh, it's a 10-inch reflector. It was a Dobsonian. Uh, I had a Canon camera, pretty normal. What's not normal is that white thing. It's the mount. The mount is uh, spectacular. It's robotic, very fancy. Very accurate. You'll see it in operation. That's what makes this thing really, really special. I can get better pictures. Orion Nebula, we're going to see this tonight, one of my favorite things. Here's a picture from my backyard in the upper left-hand corner from 10 years ago. And then it progressively, as time goes on, you get better and better. And, uh, oh, you can't quite see it. If i got to move this to the, there you go. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, you can see that uh, you get better over time, uh, both because... Uh, you put it in the desert where it's nice and dark, but also you get better at processing. And so uh, that's really important. And at a future um, time, uh, my next video, I'm thinking of putting together uh, how I process the pictures. Taking them is just the first step. So now what we're doing here is we're taking a look at, this is the desktop of the computer that's out there in the desert 2,000 miles away. This is the desktop that controls the telescope. The telescope, as you can see, is right here in the upper right-hand corner, right? And that's a live view of the camera with night vision. And, uh, and you can see our agenda of things we're going to see tonight. 
And this right here is a map of the sky. Okay, it's a planetarium program. You can get one of these on your phone. I highly recommend you can get one for your phone. Sky Safari is the best. Sky Safari on your phone, that's the best, but there's a lot of free ones. And, uh, but this just tells us where the telescope is pointing. And right now it's pointing pretty much straight overhead, and I was just focusing. So we can flip over to the other program here, and this shows what we are taking a picture of. So I'll take a picture of, I'll click the button, when I click the button, we're taking a picture. And we're taking a one second picture, once, and it, it counts down how many seconds uh, the picture was. It's downloading. And so let's take a look here. My hat is falling down. I can't see. Um, all right, so that is a little fuzzy. And so one of the most exciting things I have to show you is focusing. I mean, focusing is something you could watch me for, do for hours, right? Isn't that really exciting? No, focusing is extremely boring. So I. Uh, I want to uh, limit my focusing for you folks. I'm apologizing for this. But uh, we just want to have a nice, sharp view. And uh, before we start to talk about Orion here. Oh, look, see that we went the wrong direction for the focus right there. So what we're going to do here is go the other way. Um, now, Orion has the famous three stars in the belt. And we're going to talk about Orion and how you can see it and some of the mythology. Um, I wanted to get right to taking pictures tonight also because uh, there's clouds rolling in uh, at least an hour away. Okay, I just don't want to scare you, but I looked at uh, the, um, the, the um, satellite and, uh, okay, that's, that's much better. So what I wanted to, uh, to show you here is uh, what we're going to see tonight is Orion. Now, as you know, a lot of the constellations, uh, they, they go way back to Greek mythology. And uh, the hunter, Orion, he was the most handsome of all the guys in the sky, or on uh, all the, uh, uh, the great people on mythical Earth. And uh, Orion was actually in Homer's Odyssey. I didn't even know that until I uh, started the research for this project. Orion was described as exceptionally tall, and he was armed with an unbreakable bronze club. Um, and so in, in one myth, one of the most famous ones, uh, Orion fell in love with the Pleiades and you know, the seven sisters that we saw, when, uh, if you remember, uh, a month ago in my last uh, show. And so Orion, he fell for them, so he started pursuing them, and Zeus scooped them up and put them in the sky to keep them away from um, Orion. So the Pleiades are still represented by the seven sisters, the star cluster up there in the sky that's re right next to uh, Orion. And Orion can still be seen today chasing the, the uh, sisters across the sky. Um, and that's, that's a true statement. And in another story, uh, Orion fell in love with Merope, which is one of the seven sisters, um, who was the beautiful daughter of the king Eno Enopian. And um, she didn't return his affections. So one night, he had too much to drink, and he tried to force himself on her. And the king got really angry, and he put out Orion's eyes, and he banished him from his land, the island of Chios. And so um, Hephaestus felt sorry for the blind and wandering around Orion, and he offered one of his assistants to guide the hunter to act as his sight. So Orion eventually encountered an oracle that told him if he went east towards the sunrise, his sight would be restored. And Orion kept going towards the east, and his eyes were miraculously healed. So that's another uh, Greek mythology. But it's uh, one thing that's really uh, interesting is that the, the um, Sumerian culture, okay, that's more of the cradle of civilization in the Tigris and Euphrates area, they had uh, the myth of Gilgamesh, and they had the story of Orion, their hero, fighting the bull of heaven, uh, which is represented by Taurus. Well, you can see that um, in this next um picture here of Orion right here. There's Orion with his, with his uh, shield and his big club. He's whacking uh, Taurus there. So that's, uh, th this represents the Sumerian legend very, very well. Um, yeah, and we got a question. Oh, I, we might be lagging a bit. We might be lagging a bit. So uh, folks, you can, you can, uh, uh, Type in the chat if you think that uh, we are having a lag problem, but um, I'm, I think I'm putting I'm going just fine. But um, but 
this is very scary. This, uh, this um, sea monster here on the right is very scary. Um, but um, Orion, uh, they, th they think um, what some of the legends said that he was killed by the scorpion. And the, the scorpion is Scorpius, which is the, uh, another constellation. And they both were banished to the sky. But Orion is in the winter, and uh, the scorpion is in the summer. And so, um, yeah, the, uh, the, the, we're on a probably about a 10-second delay, 20 or 30-second delay. That's the issue here. But some of this uh, mythology is fascinating, and so I wanted to just show you some of these things. But um, Orion is one of the rare constellations that looks like what it is, because this is a freestarcharts.com. Highly recommend that. You got the three stars in his belt, as you saw. Okay, you got his uh, shield right here, and you got his club up there, and his shoulders there, and his knees or hips right there. So I think it's really a great constellation. Um, and, and it's very, very bright. And I took a picture not too long ago of all the winter constellations. And there, there's Orion right here. Okay. And uh, you've got the three stars in the belt coming up there. And Taurus is in this area. And we've got these other bright constellations. Um, the winter is a great time for bright stars, as you can tell. Here's a shot from um, West Virginia of uh, Orion coming up. And uh, I have... Uh, the star, orange star here is called Betelgeuse, and it is an amazing star that is a red giant, super giant. It is so huge that if, you, if it were where our sun is, it would envelop Earth. It's that big. It is just monstrous. And uh, a little while ago, probably a uh, little more than a year, Orion or uh, Betelgeuse started to dim, and everybody got excited and thought, oh, it's going supernova. And sure enough, it did dim because uh, this is a picture I took um, on the left. I took this shot of Betelgeuse about five years ago. On the right, same equipment, same exposure, uh, taken one year ago during the dimming. And so uh, it was really, really interesting. And everybody was getting excited. Oh, it's going supernova. It's going supernova. Well, it, uh, it, it, uh, it didn't. It warmed back up, it, it, it brightened back up, and it was not a, a supernova. They think that perhaps it was, uh, uh, it belched out a bunch of dust, perhaps, and that dust blocked the light, and so that's why it got dim. Um, and so uh, we're going to be able to see some of these things tonight. I don't know how much more we want to show here. We, I think we, we just need to get, get, on, get on with the show here. So I will take, we're going to take a picture here of the seven sisters that uh, Orion was pursuing. Uh, as, as you remember from uh, uh, a month ago, we, were, we took a picture of the seven sisters, Pleiades. And in Japan, it's, uh, the word for Pleiades is the Subaru star cluster. And so that's the, it's the logo of Subaru cars. And so now we can go over the full frame shot. And we're, we can see the whole, all the seven sisters there. But if we count, I don't know, is there seven? One, two, three, four, five, six. It's always hard to tell. Um, but uh, that's, the, that's the sisters that Orion was pursuing, and Zeus uh, got them away from, that, uh, from, from uh, the chasing uh, Orion. All right, now we're going to head over to the constellation of Orion. And if you look at my star chart here, I'll zoom in there. And the seven sisters are right here. That's where we're pointed. And with this, with this program, I'm controlling the telescope with that white mount. If I click on something, it says, OK, Orion Nebula. I click Go To. And uh, yeah, you can, in, in, you know, there'll be a few second a delay there. I wonder why That's we're. Coming. Okay. All right. So we've got Orion there. And so what we're going to do is we'll, um, we'll take a uh, picture at, and I'm just varying the sensitivity. I'm going to ISO 10,000. That's how sensitive the Canon camera is. And so we'll take like a 20 second exposure. And so when I push the button, we have a countdown 
that tells you how many seconds of the exposure that we're taking. The longer exposure you take, the better the picture is. But I think um, we'll keep the camera, the night vision on, on, the, on the, the, uh, telescope for just a bit. But uh, we don't want to mm, hurt the view. And as you can see, there, our light is shining inside the tube. I don't like to see that. But um, now it hit, probably nobody's asked, but um, the, uh, the, that silver shoebox that's on top of the telescope there, that surrounds the camera. Um, it cools the camera. So let's look at the Orion Nebula. And this is uh, the best nebula in the sky. It's a bunch of gas, excited hydrogen gas. That's the red. Red is excited hydrogen gas. It's a birthplace of stars. There are um, stars being born right now there. And uh, the ones that are being born are, are being born here in the center where it's real bright. And uh, I might take a, a short exposure to show you the stuff that's going on inside. The stuff that's really in the center is very bright, so we've overexposed. But I wanted to show you just the beautiful festoons, the billowy nature of all these beautiful clouds going all the way around. This is a real spectacular, uh, one, one of my favorite nebulas. And uh, it's something you can see with your, uh, with your binoculars at night. And I highly recommend that you do that. Get out there and take a look at it. Find the three stars in a row. Um, I can probably uh, show you right here. Let's, uh, let's go to the picture of this. Okay. Um, the three stars in the row are right here. There's two, one, two, and the third one's not there, but it's right, th right below them. So this is how you find it in binoculars. It's pretty easy to find. The horse head, which you're going to see also, is right there. So it's really neat that the horse head and the Orion Nebula are real close to each other. And you can see them both in binoculars, especially, uh, well, the, the horse head's a little harder. But um, somebody is going to ask, and so I'll just go ahead and, uh, and tell you, what are these three dashed lines? There it is. There's another one over there. And uh, I'm sure people are going to get it. It's satellites. And it's not the new ones by... Uh, Elon Musk, right? The SpaceX satellite, the thousands that he's going to put up, the Starlink constellation. Um, we we are a bit worried about the Starlink con uh, constellation because they do uh, they're all up there crisscrossing the sky all the time, and they are a bit of a nuisance. Uh, they're not going to end astronomy as we know it, but they will certainly uh, irritate us. Um, but this is a different type of satellite. These satellites are way out there, twenty three thousand miles. These are the geosynchronous satellites. So by geosynchronous means they don't move. Uh, like this one right here is probably, and I could look it up, is the direct TV satellite. Okay, so this gives you your direct TV channels. Well, if you got a direct TV dish, right, you're pointing towards that satellite. It never moves. So what's going on here? It looks like it moved. No, it didn't move. We moved. We tracked the nebula. So the nebula was moving to the right, but the these four satellites never moved. So it looked like they were moving, but we were tracking. Okay, so uh, these are the geosynchronous geostationary satellites that are twenty three thousand miles away. Sirius XM, right? If you got it in your car, yep, that's what these are: Sirius and XM, and uh, um, all the different uh, TV channels, and uh, of course uh, South America would be using these as well in Central America. So their satellites are in this orbit here, and then they crisscross the, um, the Orion Nebula area. So that's our picture of the Orion Nebula. But I want to promise you some, let's see the, just, the, just the inside. Let's take a very short exposure. This is a 20-second exposure. Let's take a very short exposure, and let's see what we can do. So I'm just going to take a, let's say, four seconds. And uh, you can see that it has the, the histogram of the colors uh, in the camera here. And there's a lot more red than green and blue, which means, hey, it's a red nebula. Duh. Um, but this is a great program called Backyard EOS, and it controls the Canon camera. I love it. And, uh, well, there's a high, high um, close-up view of the center. Okay. And look, even a four-second exposure, we are still way overexposed, didn't we? So we'll take a one-second exposure. And a way to get a nice picture of Orion Nebula is to take multiple exposures. 
and create a composite. And that's what I've done and other people do. And uh, with Photoshop, it's, it's not hard to combine them. And that's really a great idea. OK, now you can really see the center. And uh, people who've looked through a telescope know that that is the trapezium. There is four stars in a trapezoid. They're kind of all mushed together there. But those are in the center of the brightest part of the Orion Nebula. That's the trapezium. So. Um, that is just the center, and we've taken that with a one-second exposure. That's pretty amazing. And so that's what we can see when we uh, take a short exposure under this, under pretty good skies there. So what I'm going to do here is show you the full frame, and you can see how I oh um, I have a plastic um, shield around the telescope just to limit the wind. Uh, especially in springtime, the desert really whips up some heavy wind, so I, I, um, I put a, a shield of plastic to help that. But one thing about this uh, night vision camera is I don't want to keep it on all the time because uh, it's going to hurt our view um, because the night vision uses uh, ultraviolet, no, infrared, infrared camera, night vision camera, and see we're shining right down the tube. That ain't good. So, sorry, we're turning that off. Uh, just as long as we're up here, I want to show you. This is this this is the uh, the clouds. This is our satellite cloud view, and where we're where we're we are located right here. So we are doing good for clouds because there's clouds above us, north of us, and but there are clouds coming in from the west. So I just wanted to tell you that that we're we're good here for another hour, and then it's going to get get cloudy. All right. So what what kind of a picture can you take if you take Hours, okay, this is a shot for, um, uh, let's say, a half an hour. All right, now this is a shot I do have the, of the entire constellation, and there is the Orion Nebula right there. And uh, Adrian Bradley and I were together at Lake Hudson just a few weeks ago, and uh, we took pictures of Orion. This is what I got then. And um, I got to say, it's the best picture of Orion I've ever taken. Um, even though um, it's not that dark at Lake Hudson, it's pretty good at Lake Hudson, but it's not uh, not perfect. So um, I uh, I was pretty happy with this result, and I was using a, uh, a Canon uh, 6D camera, but it is modified to be sensitive to the red, and uh, it's the first time I actually got a picture of Barnard's Loop, which is more of this red excited gas, and that's kind of cool. So. Um, that's Betelgeuse there, and the three stars in the belt, and the nebula is right there. And oftentimes, yeah, people will ask me um, what kind of a what kind of a picture we can get. Um, okay, if you take hours and hours, this is hours and hours. Okay, this is four hours of exposure here, and about four hours here, and then they're stitched together right there. You can't quite see. The stitching, but in Photoshop they're put together. Yeah. Uh, well, the, that's we are that's way way that's way behind on the on the that's way behind that's okay. like half an hour behind. I don't know what's going. on. I don't understand that, but I do understand the. Uh, okay, so as long as you're seeing it, that's good. Yeah, we, we we're not getting any complaints, so that's good. Um, okay, so that's what you get if you take hours and hours, and that's what we do. We take hours and hours of pictures, we stack them up, put them together, use Photoshop mostly, and that's what astrophotographers do. And uh, one of my uh, colleagues out there in the next observatory over got this picture just this month, and um, his name is Greg Rappel, and Greg Rappel is uh, is got an amazing picture here. And what's so amazing about this shot, and it's, it's only monochrome, okay, there's no color here, but he took this picture in hydrogen alpha light, which means it's uh, infrared. So this is a near-infrared picture. So it's deep, deep, deep red filter. And look at all that amazing detail. The clouds of, uh, of the Orion Nebula go forever. So um, that is, uh, that's really an amazing shot. Um, oh, and I didn't explain that the nebula that's sitting up here next door, that's called the Running Man. Let's take a picture of the Running Man. I want to do that. Uh, but before we leave this, 
people ask me, well, what if I look through a, a telescope? What do I see? Well, if you look through a telescope at the Orion Nebula, a good telescope, this is what you're going to see. Kind of like what we saw like in our four-second exposure, you'd see that. With one difference, no color. You're not going to see any color. So, sorry. The, the, that beautiful red will not be there. Our eye cannot uh, see those colors because it is so faint. Just like when you look out in the garden at night, uh, even during a full moon, your garden doesn't have, have beautiful flower colors at night. You can't see those. So it's just because it's so uh, so faint. So this is what you'd see uh, in a telescope. Like if you came to Peach Mountain, if we were able to do those uh, Peach Mountain lowbrow sessions um, this summer, if we're allowed, um, we'll be able to show you. And it's going to, well, in the summer, you can't see Orion, can you? So I lied. Well, next winter, if we can do these, you're going to be able to see all that. So highly recommend that. And we're going to see this now. That's the uh, Running Man Nebula. That's I, I took this just a couple weeks ago. So... This is four hours. Let's see what we can do in 20 seconds. It's right next door, but I want to zoom in here. We're zooming in on the Orion Nebula in our planetarium program. This is the program that the, the, the telescope uses for pointing purposes. And I hit go to the running man, and of course we're real close by. 20 seconds at 10,000 ISO, which is really the sensitivity. We've cranked up the gain. That's what we. That's another way of calling it. And the reason we can crank up the sensitivity and not have a bad picture is that it's cold out there tonight. It's uh, 44 degrees in the desert, I see. And uh, my camera, if you look right here, it, my camera is at 43 degrees. And so when it's 43 degrees, you can really um, crank up the uh, sensitivity without getting a lot of noise. There's the running man. Now, he's he's kind of sideways there. I think his head is here, and there's a arm there. I mean, it's, it's really hard to see. I'll go full full frame on this one. And as you can see, we're right close to the uh, Orion Nebula still. And there's those pesky those uh, satellites. Very irritating. Um, people ask me, well, well, aren't they going to ruin your picture? Well, they don't because you can... Uh, when you stack up lots of individual frames, those uh, satellites move from frame to frame, and so they get canceled out. They get averaged out. So only the stuff that stays is it, it gets added together. So that's the Running Man Nebula. As you can see, it's not as bright, but what I like about it is look at these dark clouds. Dusty, very, very dusty. So that's, uh, this is the Running Man Nebula, and you can see our, our focus is going downhill. So um, you're going to have the rare um, privilege now of seeing, uh, uh, seeing a focus again. Um, but hey, let's focus on Betelgeuse. Now, professionals don't call it Betelgeuse. They call it Betelgeuse or Betelgeuse, but it's too much fun just to call it Betelgeuse. So I'm just going to call it Betelgeuse. So we're going to go to that, zoom up there. And uh, we're just going to take a one-second exposure just to get the focus down. Um, and you're going to be able to see how orange this super giant star really is. It is very orange and huge. And I, I wish it would go supernova in our lifetime. That'd be a lot of fun. And you can tell that uh, we're seeing doubles on the uh, star spike, the uh, Spikes there, so something's obviously wrong, but it's easy to fix because I got the. This is the focuser, and it just it, instead of using your fingers to you know to focus you know in and out in and out, we just push the button. So we'll push the button to go out by two clicks. Take a picture, and there's a way to automate this, but it, this the, the winds are very heavy, uh, very aloft. Um, the jet stream might be over the observatory tonight, and. Uh, that's what's messing with our focus is the atmosphere is very, very unsteady out, out there tonight. Um, and so that didn't help. So we're going to go in six clicks. But uh, that will get us really good, though. Here we go.
how, how John asks, how long till uh, Betelgeuse goes supernova? Well, Betelgeuse is 600 light years away. So what we're seeing right here is from 600 years ago. Okay, the light took 600 years to get here. So, hey, it could be supernova already. If it went supernova 100 years ago, it's, we won't know for 100 years. Well, we won't know for 500 years, right? Um, so uh, it's, it's something that's going to happen, but astronomers say that it's going to happen imminently, but in a star's lifetime, Im imminent could be 100,000 years. Okay? So it's going to happen. We aren't quite sure, uh, but it's going to happen pretty soon. Um, but um, it will, it, uh, it'll be fantastic because Betelgeuse will be so bright, you'll see it during the daytime. During the daytime. Brighter than the full moon. It'll be visible during the daytime for maybe six months. It'll be one of the most amazing things in the sky that we've ever seen. So I would love to see it happen. And we wouldn't die. Uh, if it were closer, we would die. But uh, if it, since it's 600 light years away, we don't have to worry about that. We do have to worry about if, if a closer star were to blow up supernova, we'd be toast. So our focus is fixed. We're ready to go to the next one, which on my list is nearby. It's the horse head. And we click on this. And I know it's right there. NG2023. We'll go for, uh, let's go for 30 seconds. The Horsehead is, is another one of these red, um, excited gas nebulas. It glows red, and the horse's head shape is a blob of dust, a dust cloud, that obscures the red behind. So it just so happens that the, this dust cloud has the fortunate shape of a, uh, a horse's head. And it's changing over time, so, and it's hundreds of light years away, so in uh, another thousand years, Probably won't look like a horse's head at all. Just just some other blob. Unlike the Orion Nebula, the horse's head is hard to see in a telescope. It's faint and tough, tough, tough to see. So um, astrophotography is the way to, to get to get a good shot of it. And there's the horse's head right there. See, even 30-second exposure, we're not able to really uh, get a bright image here because this red gas is not that bright, but it's pretty, pretty cool. And um, this star here is the leftmost of the three in the belt. Three stars in Orion's belt, and there is the left one right there. It's called Mintaka. And it is, this is one of the most uh, complex um, regions of the sky right here. There's so much going on in one shot. You got the bright star, okay? You got the horse head and this cool red nebula. Then we have this bluish nebula with a lot of really cool uh, structure. And uh, I always saw like a sea serpent or something in there. If you blow it up real in, in, in a picture, um, that's cool. because It's blue and it's got this sea serpent in it. And then this here is called the flame nebula. And again, it's a, uh, a cloud of gas, but a lot of really cool dust clouds that emanate from it. It's kind of like it's exploding from the middle. Very cool. And look at all this other stuff we got going on here. We have a satellite. Now, this one could have been one of Elon's. I bet you this is one of Elon's coming this way because uh, it's not a short one like those geosynchronous faraway ones. This looks like a close near-Earth orbit. And so that could be a, a low-Earth orbit, LEO uh, satellite, which would be um, Starlink. And then we get these little ones there and a little one there. And those could be work, you know, and since those are together and going the same dis distance, same direction, those could be part of Starlink. He just launched in the last week, right? And so it takes them several days to reach orbit. So um, it could be, these two could be uh, Starlink. I wouldn't doubt it. Um, every picture I take has a satellite in it, I swear. Um, and the long exposure shots sometimes have a little line in them. And it's not a satellite, it's an asteroid. So... This is a 30-second shot of the Flame Nebula and the horse head. What do you get if you go for five hours? Or that was the, uh, the running man right there. For five hours, this is what you get. You get a much deeper view, better colors, brighter, um, and you can really see the head of the horse there. You can see some structure inside the head there. 
And um, this little sea serpent thing, it looks like a dinosaur. I always think in this bluish, um, really cool nebula there, and then the flame. And that's Mintaka. So um, really cool to have the, the horse head. It just kind of bubbles out of nowhere there. And uh, it's a great, great object. And again, this is something uh, you can see, at least this, in binoculars. If you take a look at the left star in Orion's belt, look for a glow next to it, you'll see this. You will not see this. In fact, you, I've even used 20-inch telescopes, 24-inch telescopes, out where it's dark and had trouble seeing this. So it's a tough one. So that was the horse's head. And uh, maybe it's time to uh, show you um, some, what you can get on a, on a uh, video of, uh, so of the Orion Nebula. I got a, I got a nice um, video of, I got a couple videos of Orion I want to show you. All right, here is a video of uh, Orion rising up in the full moon in the desert. So the full moon's coming up. Orion is right up here. It looks like the sun's coming up, but it's not. It's the full moon. And this was taken near Tucson several years ago. I was camping out there in a full moon. I'll play it again. And you can see, see an airplane, airplanes whiz by. But uh, you can even even in this low power, you can see the Orion Nebula right there, right below the three in the belt, right there. That's the Orion Nebula right there. So that is uh, that's what you can see um, from the desert. Of course, is really nice. It's called the Ironwood Forest. It's right near Tucson. Really cool. And then um, this video helps you figure out helps you uh, see how the telescope works. This is a time lapse of the telescope working throughout a whole night. And there's the Orion Nebula right there. I'll play it again. I made the stars real bright in this video um, by putting a filter over the lens. It's basically like, like a fog filter. That allows you to, it bloats the stars and it emphasizes their colors. All right, so that just gives you an idea of uh, what, what you can see um, in a video of, of the time lapse of Orion, which is the best winter constellation. Now we're going to go for the Rorschach. I call this the Rorschach Nebula because I don't know what it looks like. Everybody who sees it sees something different. And it's called Messier 78 also. I'll go back to the chart. And we're pointing to his hip, right? A little bit, a little, uh, his torso, edge of his torso. Uh, this star chart sh uh, denotes um, the little green circles are um, distant objects, deep sky objects like nebulas, star clusters, galaxies. They're all shown here. I turned off the um, labels, uh, otherwise it's just it's full of all kinds of words and confusing. So no need to see all that stuff. But um, uh, it's very nice to have a, a star chart, the telescope that uh, goes wherever you point to. So we're 45 seconds, and we're going to get the Rorschach here. That's my word. Nobody else calls it the Rorschach. I'm the only person that's, that's my name. I'm wondering if we're starting to get some clouds, because, you know, that isn't as spectacular as I thought it would be. Let's take a look at the cloud Let's do a uh, refresh. Uh, we're starting to get some high clouds, but not too bad. We have cloud sensors and all this fancy stuff, too. But um, 
you can definitely see that, hey, there's no stars here. And then there's these two weird dark areas. Oh, they're bright with some dark. So, like, what is, what is going on here? So um, I call it the Rorschach because each person sees something different here. So let's take a look at, at what the Rorschach Nebula looks like here. Oh, that's the, the witch head. We'll go to that next. There's the Rorschach right there. Uh, this is about seven hours of exposure in order to bring it out. But look at all the inky black um, dust clouds with these bright white and blue ones behind it. Interesting blobs here. So it's like ink blots, right? So I call it the Rorschach. But it's very unusual. And I put this one on my calendar this year because it was just so unusual. So that's the that's M78 or the uh, Rorschach. All right, so we didn't see, oh, we have a question. People asked about the horse's head. How did folks long ago have the visual resolution to make out the horse's head? The horse head, yeah. Yeah, when was it called the horse head? Because, you know, it's, uh, wow, that's a good, I, I bet you, I, I don't know the answer uh, when it was, because uh, I would imagine it was since photographic evidence. I would, you know, uh, the, you can't see the, the horse's head nebula with your eye unless you got a huge telescope. And uh, it's just, it's really tough to see. Um, so I can't imagine that it was anything other than um, uh, from photographs from when they started taking pictures, right, 120 years ago. So I would imagine that would be the case. So we can try to see the witch's head. Uh, so can you see the, the uh, witch's head there? The, there's a witch uh, in, in relief there. It's called the Witch Head Nebula. It is uh, a little different. This one is not red. It's blue. And it does not glow from its own. It reflects light from a star nearby. And this has the relief of a witch's head. And so this made me think of that famous optical illusion. Do you see the young woman or do you see the old lady? There's two here. And once you see one, it's hard to see the other. And some research showed that um, older folks tend to see the older woman and younger folks see the younger woman. Um, and it's hard to switch back and forth. But um, the younger woman is looking away from you. That's her eyelash, and that's her nose, and that's her hair. And she's looking that way. Okay, so that is the uh, young lady. And the old, older lady has her chin buried down in her black coat, and that's her mouth right there, her chin, and her large nose and her eyes there. This is pretty famous. This has been around for over 100 years. And uh, so that's the witch. That, that gives us uh, kind of an entree into the witch's head nebula. So I'll close this. And we're going to go back to the star chart. And my notes say the witch head is NGC 1909. So I have to, this is a little bit of an esoteric target. Or is it ICC2118? Well, we're going to go. We're going to go for this. All right. Let's just uh, let's take a 10-second exposure. And the witch is hard to find. I was, I was uh, struggling with it last night. If this doesn't work, we'll go to NGC1909. And we're having a pretty slow um, delay between your chat and what I'm doing. I'm sorry. So um, I'm going to be... Oh, and Adrian's helping us on... Um, on the horse head, yeah, and Neil too. Thank you very much. Yeah, you guys can figure out how they, how that name came about because I don't, really, I don't know. All right, now there's no witch head here. There is a little satellite and a bunch of little galaxies, if you can see. So that obviously is not it. So we'll go over here to what I thought it was. N G C.
1909. Unknown. Oh, man. All right. Well, I'm, I'm striking out here. Nope. We don't, I don't think we want to take any more time on that. Um, but if somebody wants to get tell me what, uh, what, what I should be putting in for the witch head, I messed up on that one. But so if we can't do that, we can do something that's almost as good. What's over here? The rosette. This is, and if you watch the coming attractions in my um, slideshow before we started the show, you saw my picture of the rosette. And the, the rosette is another one of these great, fantastic um, um, gas nebulas that is a place where stars are born. And uh, it's very red. And uh, we're going to take a 30-second exposure. And so we're counting up to 30 here. And the rosette looks like a rose. And it's beautiful. And there are, there are stars being born there. So you're going to be able to see uh, the places. I'll show you the little places where stars are being born inside cocoons. And we're going to take a look at some of those cocoons here in a second. One thing about Orion is every time I see it, I, I, I shiver because Orion means cold. Orion only comes out in the winter. If you're looking at Orion, it's a pretty good bet you're cold. Growing up in the Midwest. All right. Now we are correctly on our object. A little off to the side there, but um, you can see that we have the rows there, and this is where stars are being born. And there are protostars inside these little black areas. See these little black areas there? They're called Bach globules. And I like to think of them as um, little, little uh, embryos, little uh, tiny um, sacs where uh, the stars are being born inside, the dark ones there. And there's another satellite. And what's really cool about this is you can see what happens once a star does um, blow up or uh, ignite and start to um, start its nu uh, nuclear fires, it blows a hole in the center of the, of the nebula. These young stars were recently born, and there was, used to be a bunch of gas there. And just because of their, uh, their pressure and, and blowing out their uh, radiation, they cleared out the center of the, um, the, the, the rosette nebula. So that's kind of cool there. And so what do you get if you take a four-hour exposure instead of uh, 30 seconds? Let me show you. There. And you can really see these Bach globules. There, you can see a couple right there. All right. Little cocoons right there. Cocoon right there, right there, right there. All the way around here. You can see all those cocoons. And then you see the bright stars in the middle that have blown a hole in the center. And, uh, and so... Yeah, Belinda says that I see 2118 is the witch head. Okay, let's go back to the witch head. That's, yeah, I don't know what I messed up there. But the rosette is beautiful. Uh, uh, you, you can see that in binoculars, but it's not easy. Um, some of these objects are, are really, really hard to see. Now, look at that. Oh, we're going to do an online search. Okay, I see 2118. There we go. Put this out of the way. Now we're going to go for the witch. Head nebula. I could turn down the speed, otherwise, it's going to get a very noisy picture. But she is faint. We'll go for 45 seconds. She's very faint. And while you're um, waiting, let's go back up. And I captured it here in Michigan just a couple weeks ago, uh, the, the witch head. Take a look at this. Let's go back, 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 right there. There it is, right there. So you can see that this reflects the light of this bright star, which is called Rigel. Rigel is super bright, bluish, and so this reflects 
The witch's head is right there. Our focus is not perfect, but uh, it'll be fine. We're, we're not taking pictures of uh, globular clusters, which we will need better focus for. Nebulas are fuzzy anyhow, so we can have pretty bad focus and it won't detract. The longest single exposure from this location from Pat. Um, I can go 10 minutes. Um, I'm really tracking dependent, okay? The skies would probably let me go for 20 minutes. This is the darkest place in, you know, in North America, so uh, you can go for probably 20-minute exposure if you can track that well. So, yeah. And this is what we were looking at before, remember? And the witch is invisible. Okay, we're not going to give up. We're going to, we'll crank up the gain, crank up the sensitivity all the way to the top. We'll try 45 seconds again. But uh, yeah, it, 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 what I, when I was taking pictures with Adrian a few weeks ago in Michigan here, the longest exposure I could do from, with my camera was one minute. I could take a one minute shot. Uh, and and uh, anything longer than that, the light pollution was fogging and, and, and it was washing out things. Uh, so uh, that just shows you you can go from one minute to uh, 20 minutes um, because it's, it's so much darker there. And with so many people getting into astrophotography, it is fantastic. And people are becoming aware of, hey, ooh, that picture isn't great. Oh, it's because of the light pollution. Oh, th there's light pollution? And... The realization is that you got to go a long way, uh, especially from Ann Arbor. You got to go a long way to try to get away from light pollution. It's kind of frustrating, um, but that's why I moved everything out to the desert because it's uh, there's no light domes, no light at all anywhere. Okay, so we've got more noise here, but hopefully we'll pick up the witch. Look at that. I wonder if there's something wrong with the the way it was entered in this program. Or, no, we went online to the sim bed. I can see something over here. Do you see those? So, well, I'll move it over for you. See? There's something there. But the witch is hiding. But as long as we're here, take a look at this uh, spiral barred spiral. This is like one of the coolest little miniature spar barred spiral galaxies. Okay, we've gone too far on the magnification back off. But um, this is what you call a barred spiral. We did uh, a month ago, we did a show on galaxies. We didn't see a barred spiral. So here's one. It goes, the bar goes across the nucleus and there's an arm spinning that way and then one that way. But there's another galaxy there too. So well, looks like we struck out with the, the witch's head. So, um, but we we have a few more minutes. I wanted to you know go an hour or until people get tired. So, if uh, if there are requests, I can take requests now. As we, uh, I might show you another video of that of that Orion um, coming up. So, let me go ahead and get that video going. If anybody has a special request they want to see in Orion, we can do that. I think somebody just sent me a text. Yep. Well, something is going on with my, uh, pro my, it's not finding it. Well, the witch, the witch has gone away. So what I'm going to do next is uh, show you a, uh, a video that I took. Um, in West Virginia. I'm having some trouble finding it. Well, no matter. Um, but it is, uh, it's the best constellation is the Oh, I wanted to also maybe show you that one thing that you can do that's really kind of cool is um, I made this. 
I think you saw it earlier, the, uh, back in the 1600s, artists painted these beautiful murals of the, the sky. And uh, they even made them into um, uh, globes. And you can download um, the, the images. And you can see the, the, there's kind of like a crab here. And uh, Orion is like right there, right? And then, and the, but it's um, really cool. So you, I downloaded this and it's paper and I just cut it out, right? And then taped it together. Um, and there's, there's some really cool plants you can get. And I was thinking of making a, a globe. This is really only like, you know, part of globe. It's like a football. But, uh, but there's the, the great bear, right? There's uh, um, Ursa Major. So, that's kind of fun. Um, so, but if you have questions or requests, go ahead because I wanted to really focus on on the things in um, Orion tonight, or or we could go a little bit farther away. In the me meantime, let's go to the brightest star in the sky and northern sky, Sirius, the dog star, and Sirius is the brightest thing that we have in our northern sky. And we'll just take a one-second exposure of Sirius, and it is brilliantly blue, so um, bluish-white. And it's a beautiful star, so we'll take a picture of Sirius. And go full frame on that. And so what that's telling me is that we've got the, the high clouds have moved in because uh, these, we have a dark surrounding area and it would not normally look like this. So we've uh, those, those high clouds have moved into the area. And so, um, but you know, it's kind of cool that um, the high clouds though have accentuated the color. And you can see that Sirius is a bluish white uh, star. It's a beautiful star. And it's, it's relatively close. And um, Ani wants to see Thor's helmet. Well, okay, we can try Thor's helmet, even though the I just need an I need an NGC on that thing. Let me see if I can find it. Thor's helmet. Two three five nine. Well, we'll give it a shot. We'll try Thor's helmet, but man, it's uh with with clouds moving in. It's, it's going to be tough, but let's find it here. Find targets. What, what's cool is that um, with, with some of these great um, um, apps that you have, you know, in your, in your pocket, um, they, they can do these things as good or better than what we're doing right here. Uh, Sky Safari is spectacular. Okay, so Thor's helmet is a rather faint, I've taken a picture of it before, it's a rather faint uh, object. So while the uh, picture is being taken, I'll take a, I'll show, I'll, I'll try to find uh, the most recent picture I took of Thor's helmet. Because it's kind of interesting, it's a, uh, Twisty. It, it's uh, it, it's very unusual. Well, it's not revealing itself. There we go. There you go. That's the Thor's helmet. We're, this is what we're going to be looking at. Oh, and I even put a... There, that, that's, what <laughs> that's Thor's helmet right there. So this, he's got the wings. And uh, it's green, isn't it? So this is what we're trying to take a picture of. So it, we, we're probably not going to be able to get this in a short exposure, especially with these high clouds. Watch for this orange star and the two little ones next to it, okay? The orange and the two little ones. Try to spot these. So I don't know. Oh, there it is right there. Not bad. Let's go full frame on that. Yep, there it is.
I mean, it's not too impressive, but there's that orange star and the two little ones. And this is the helmet right there. And you can see one wing, helmet wing there, faint, and the other one's right there. So uh, thank you, Ani, for that suggestion. Yeah, Thor's helmet. That's a cool one. Um, this picture also is interesting because it shows us the various colors of stars. We're seeing some orange stars there and a lot of yellow stars. A, a lot of stars, or maybe is it most, are um, dwarfs and white dwarfs, and they're kind of yellowish. And there's a lot of faint yellow stars in this picture. Big orange one, but and then bright one, bright uh, white ones. So there's a range of colors here. All right, let's go back to the chart. What is nearby? Well, I want to do a better job of focusing. We're going to go to Rigel, which is another great um, blue giant star. And uh, this is the one that is so bright that it illuminates the witch's head nearby. So let's take a picture of that. Yeah, I had so many things open. It's so hard to uh, keep things straight when you have 100 different uh, windows open. All right, so our focus, again, is just poor. So let's go. And usually when the telescope gets cold, it shrinks. And that makes the focus go out. As, it, as the tube gets smaller, then the light gets pushed out. And usually I have to move the uh, focuser out. But weirdly earlier tonight it was doing the opposite so i don't it's it must be the jet stream or something going on with the mountains here yeah that's better i'll go another couple in two more and uh, this is rigel and beautiful star Hi highly recommend people get out there if there's a, a clear evening here in michigan get out there and take a look at uh, uh, orion with, with binoculars it's fantastic I can see the wind is kicking up out there, too. Um, I can hear it. I have the audio going. This is the, this is the tracking of the telescope. Um, the red is um, RA. The blue is deck. Or the red is azimuth. And the blue is altitude. And the wind is whipping this thing around. And the telescope is working hard to keep it centered. So you can see that every time it gets puffed off to the side by the wind, um, the motors pull it back to uh, the center. So this allows me to even get a, a pretty good picture, even with a little bit of wind. I can get up to uh, maybe 8 miles an hour, and I can get a decent picture. But anything more than 8 or 10, it's, it's, uh, it's going to be a problem. But this wind just kicked up here. We did not have any wind for the for. Uh, and since we started, so um, that 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 is a factor right now. But um, it 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 won't shut us down. Um, if you saw that picture earlier up at Orion's head, is that huge um, red nebula? Did you did you see that? I'm wondering we, if we can capture that. Let's let's take a look at that. See this? This is his head, right? Look at that beautiful red nebula. Now, it's huge. My field of view, as you know, the field of view it just barely fits in the running man right there and Orion right there. So our field of view is, is as big as my cursor, okay? So if we take a picture of these three stars here, maybe we'll pick up some of the red. So let's take a picture of that right, that, right there. This is an IC. I don't need the number because I know that if we just point to these three, we'll get it. We're going to go right there. Maisa, the star called Maisa. Looks like Melissa with a missing L. And let's hope that the uh, the clouds haven't heard us yet there. But what I usually do when I'm taking a picture is like all night, I'll set this thing up right here to take three-minute exposures, and it'll take another one and another one and another one. Just keep taking three-minute exposures for, let's say, four hours. 
as, as something goes across the sky. And so I set it up to go, and then I go to bed. And uh, in the morning, I will uh, get up and uh, put the telescope back to where it belongs and uh, shut things down. Uh, it is not automated, and that's what I want to do this, uh, this spring. My plan is to automate the telescope so it can uh, go from object to object by itself overnight. And most importantly, it will focus itself. And so that's something I'm hoping that I can get it up and running. But because of the plague, I was unable to get out there in November, which was my plan. No red nebula. Hmm. Well, it is faint. Like I said, it's tough to really uh, get. It's it's tough to get um, something like that. Um, and it's big. My phone uh, alerts me when there's somebody that enters the observatory. I have a uh, surveillance camera, the the camera that uh, we were using here, and uh, it'll actually make the noise if there is a wind. And it just gave me a, a, an alert that, that the wind is kicking up a bit. But uh, what I think we want to do is at least try to see one more thing. And uh, Todd asks, if a star just 600 light years away goes supernova, won't we be affected from the gamma radiation? And uh, from what I understand, no. We're far enough away that the gamma and the other radiation is not going to be a problem. Um, no, it's far enough away. It's not going to hurt us. Um, I think it needs to be less than 50 um, light years or 100 light years to really um, offer a threat to life on Earth. And Ani is the king of, of obscure stuff. He's, he's recommended something else. The Boogeyman Nebula. I don't think I've ever gotten a picture of that, but I remember the Boogeyman from... Nightmare Before Christmas. Okay, where is this thing? Oh, there it is. Well, the boogeyman's... That's the Rorschach, isn't it? It looks close to the Rorschach. All right. So this is the boogeyman nebula. I don't know what we might get, but we're going to take a shot. Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping that, that um, Beetlejuice does go supernova. That would be a blast, literally. Um, oh, Neil uh, suggests about the Crab Nebula. That's a wonderful suggestion. We are going to do the Crab Nebula. Um, definitely going to go for the Crab because that is a good one. That is a supernova remnant. And so that's perfect for this discussion because... Um, Beetlejuice is going to go supernova, and it's going to leave a pile of gas, and we're going to be able to see it maybe in our lifetime, probably not. But Crab Nebula is, is where one blew up a thousand years ago. All right, 30-second exposure for the boogeyman. We've got a satellite. No boogeyman. Boogeyman is dark. He's hiding. I can kind of see him right here, right? It's it's there. There's something going on right there. And this star here looks like it's it's enveloped in some bluish clouds. Sorry, Oni. Kind of struck out on the boogeyman. I think I'm gonna need. I would need a longer exposure to see that. Um, I'm gonna have some equipment maybe later um, this year, and we'll be able to see some of this fainter stuff. But. Uh, no, we struck out on that. But hey, the focus looks nice. Look how that sharp star there. And we're going to go over to the Crab Nebula. This is uh, M1, so the blown up star from a thousand years ago. It's right there in Taurus. Let's close this. Crab Nebula. We're going to go there. And uh, yeah, I think it was the year 1054 that people saw this new star in the sky, and it was super bright. Again, it was visible even in the daytime, and uh, it was recorded in artwork that exists today. That's pretty amazing. It happened a 1,000 years ago. And 
and the structure of it is a bit like a crab. That's how it got its name. Oh, there's an NGC question. And Tim asks about the Eskimo. Tim, give me the NGC on the Eskimo. <laughs> the Hubble? Um, I'm not allowed on, on the, no, I'm, I'm not allowed to share the Hubble, um, but uh, I wish I were. But um, it would be cool, but um, um, I'm very happy with my equipment here. Because look, at, we're going to get a picture of the crab right there. So you can see those red tendrils that, that kind of curve around inside. Uh, and it's surrounded by a, a white cloud. And uh, that is a, uh, a remnant of an exploded star, huge exploded star that exploded 1,000 years ago. In the center, which we can't quite see, there is a pulsar that's a remnant. It's just, it's just like a beating heart, a little beating heart star that's right in the middle that's still there, um, spinning rapidly and putting out um, a lot of uh, uh, radiation. So um, that, that's, this, this is really cool. It's the, um, the Crab Nebula. And I'm going to go full frame so you can see. And it's just, it's not very big. See how small it is? Uh, and uh, it's far away. I bet uh, it's it's definitely f was further than um, the Betelgeuse, which is 600. Uh, so, um, so that's the crab. And so, um, and it's more straight overhead. So I don't think our, we our cr a cloud problem is probably if we go low in the sky, we should avoid that. But if we point straight overhead, we're still going to be okay. So. We're going to go for our, another exploded star from a smaller exploded star this time called the Eskimo Nebula. And so I'm going to uh, go to that. And it's got two, it's got two um, databases here I can play with. It's got the well-known stuff. So if I just type Eskimo, there it is. So the well-known stuff is easy to find here. You click on it, and then click Go To. And we're off screen. We're going to have to zoom out. Oh, there. It's in uh, Gemini. Can you see the Gemini twins there? There's one head, other head, of the, the two uh, brothers, and their legs and their feet. So we're in Gemini, Eskimo. And so one thing about what we learned a month ago, or was it two months ago, that it the amount of exposure you use is really important. So let's just start with a two-second exposure with the Eskimo and see what we get. And then we'll, then we'll take a longer one. And we're zoomed in. There. And this is supposed to look like a... Um, Eskimo with a fur collar. Look, you're looking at a, a hat with a fur collar. Um, but you can definitely see the star in the middle. That's the star that is uh, dying, and it's puffing off uh, uh, this gas bubble around it. So I misspoke earlier. It's not an exploded star. It's it's just dying, but not exploding. So you can definitely see this outer shell, these two shells that it's putting out. But, okay, that's just a two-second exposure. What, what, what do we get with um, 15 seconds? We're at 462% magnification here, so we've really zoomed in. If I zoom out, you can see how small this thing is. It's just a star that's dying. It's a planetary nebula. That's another name for it. <clears throat> Pretty poor name. But look how small it is. All right, so that was two seconds. And here we go. We're going to get the 15 second or in a second here. It's coming. There. And, wow, even 15 seconds almost overexposed some of the fringe in, in the, in the uh, fur hat. <laughs> you can see the fur up there. Um, let's go 30 and see if we get anything more. But isn't the colors cool? Planetary nebula, these dying star nebulas, they have great color. They can be very bright blue. They can be aqua. They can be green. Um, um, the Ring Nebula um, has red that we see. 
and uh, the dumbbell also. So you can see a full range of colors in, in these planetary nebula. They call them planetary nebulas because people with crappy telescopes 400 years ago said, hey, those look like a planet. Oh, no, they're not a planet. They're circular, disc-shaped and small, like a planet. And there's uh, 30 seconds. We're not getting much more. It seems like, I bet you the optimal is 10 seconds. We want to get the, the nice, this uh, detail. I have a picture of it that's pretty nice that shows um, some good detail. What was the NGS? 2392. There, you're starting to see some detail there. Um, and here's there we go. There's what you're looking at right there. I took this, um, and I combined the short and the long exposures. So you can kind of see that the, the, the Eskimo uh, coat and detail inside. But um, yeah, that's a pretty nice little uh, nebula there. And and um, I maybe lied earlier, I said you can't see colors. You can see this green color. If you use a telescope with your eye, you will see this as a green color. It's really, really cool. It's kind of shocking how green this is. So I highly recommend you, you take a look at that. And, and the way to find it is um, the two stars here for Gemini, it's nearby there. So that is a good one. Oh, one of my favorite star clusters. we got to see this. This is fantastic. It's also in Gemini M35. And what's spectacular about this is that um, it's two star clusters in one. Um, there's a close, close star cluster, and then there's a far away one um, and older. And because uh, when stars get older, they get more yellow. And so the older um, cluster, you can definitely see the difference between the young cluster and the old cluster. Young stars are more blue. Old stars are more yellow and orange. And as they die, they turn red like Betelgeuse. doing a 30-second exposure. Well, we were able to see everything except the witch head. The good thing I didn't put the witch head in my agenda. So, hey, we didn't fail. It wasn't in the agenda. All right. I see nothing here, but we go full screen, and you'll see a pretty cool picture here. This is M35, the close-by star cluster, and this is a, a, a faraway NGC. I forget the number. And it's, but look how the stars are gold there, and these are more white. So these are older and further away. We can zoom in on them a little bit. It's a beautiful um, uh, combination of, and this is something that is truly spectacular in a telescope. Um, this picture does not do it justice. Um, we are not getting the dynamic range here between black and white. If you look through a telescope, Space is black. Stars are blinding white. That's a dynamic range that we're not representing here at, uh, on your screen. It's, we can't even come close to representing that. So highly recommend that this is one of the great things that we can't re reflect in a picture. Got to take a look at this through a telescope. But um, what you can't see in a telescope is the color as well. So this really captures the, the difference in the colors with the, the white versus the gold. Now, somebody's probably going to ask me for the jellyfish. The jellyfish is right here, but I can try. But it's it's really uh, faint. There's a, a jellyfish, which is a, a supernova remnant, which is in this area as well, right near um, the feet of the Gemini twins. Like I said, here's one twin. There's the other. They're kind of like arm in arm. 
uh, Pollux and Castor. And well, that's something interesting. Might take a picture of a double star. We haven't done that tonight, have we? Let's take a picture of double star. One second, and we'll turn our sensitivity way, way down. We'll just, this is a very low sensitivity picture because we really want to split the double, split the double. And we'll go to 800 ISO. 800 is what I normally shoot with. When I'm taking a picture for three minutes, my normal exposure is three minutes, and I use the ISO 800 because it's just a nice all-around number. You're going to give low, um, low noise. All right, so they're they're almost touching. Can you see that? I mean, what we have a football-shaped star, but it looks like they're touching. So we we've overexposed. Um, so we'll we'll let's go all the way down to ISO 100. This is the least. I can do with the telescope, ISO 100. It's the least sensitive, but notice we're not having any noise. Noise is gone. The picture's nice and smooth. Up, oh, you can almost see the two stars right there. Holy cow, we we, we've overexposed there. So we can make it even shorter. I can go to a quarter second. And this is what you might do if you were taking a picture of the moon. The moon is very bright, so you only want a thousandth of a second on the moon, and that's what we do. There, now you can kind of get two stars there. <laughs> we got to go even less. Let's go crazy. Let's go to a hundredth of a second. So we're illustrating um, the difference with various shutter speeds. Whoa, what is that? You know what that is? That's called uh, atmosphere. <laughs> Something is going on. Let's let's uh, let's go back up to a fifty of the second and try again. Um, the atmosphere is like Arr! the star is being jerked around, and and so uh, this is what you get. Um, I want to get a decent picture of this double star. Oh, that's worse. I think uh, I think the the clouds and the uh, the turbulence in the atmosphere is is conspiring against us. Well, that looks like the space station. Hey, we got a picture of the space station. No, sorry about that. Well, we tried, but anyhow, that's that's the 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 um, the twin star called Castor, and it's one of the two in the Gemini. And people ask, is there any uh, op any uh, spectacular things happening in the sky um, eh, right now? And the answer is no. <laughs> At least I don't know of anything that's too spectacular that's happening right now. Or, But we do have some good things coming up this year. We have a, a lunar eclipse, and we have um, the moon uh, covering up planets and, and some cool things. Uh, We've got a couple, the best meteor showers of the year will be the Geminids, all right, coming from Gemini right here, uh, in, in the middle of uh, December. They're the best meteors of the year, um, in, and they happens in the middle of December. And there's going to be a little bit of a moon, but it's still uh, towards dawn, it's supposed to be spectacular. So keep an eye out for the Geminids in December. And then um, our summer Perseids in August are supposed to be very good. Uh, the moon will not be interfering too much. So um, I think that will probably be the primary Michigan star party of the year will be to look at the um, the Perseid meteor shower. And Pers the Perseids are, are not in the sky now, so we can't even show them because this is the winter time and, and uh, the constellation of Perseus is a summertime. Did I just lie? Yeah, I did. Perseus is right there. All right, I lied. Perseus, the Perseids come from this spot right here. So, um, um, but in the summer, it's just coming up. Right now, it's going down. So, um, highly recommend uh, you get out there. I think it's August 12th. August 12th. Make plans. Make plans to be out there for the Perseid meteor shower. Uh, take pictures. Um, this red dot right here, people ask me, what's that? That's Mars. Want to take a picture of Mars? Let's go take a take a picture of Mars.
Mars was really close last year. It was great. You could see um, details on the planet's surface. I saw it the best I'd ever seen in my life. It was fantastic. You could see the white polar cap. And there's an, uh, a kind of an overexposed picture of Mars. And um, it's, it is getting kind of late. But, um, oh, I got there's a question by ER. And the question is, is there any photographic post-processing taking place regarding the images we're viewing? If so, what? Okay, that's a great question. What you are seeing on my screen is perfectly, exactly the way it comes out of the camera. There is no post-processing. It is the raw image, unaltered. Okay, so um, yeah, what, I, what you got here was unaltered. I could do some tweaking in this program, but I have no tweaking. So the answer is they're pristine. And so um, that's what I would do for to show you live images. And you saw my final images, and that's what you get if you add them all up. And then if you use a, a program like Photoshop to bring out the colors and bring out the, uh, the, the contrast. So uh, that's it. Um, and people always ask, well, are those colors real? Well, yeah, they, they're there. Okay, I'm not making up colors. I'm not adding color. My camera is a color camera. It's a little bit, it emphasizes red. Uh, uh, it's sensitive to red, so it emphasizes red, but I'm not making up colors. Um, but uh, the, you do um, change color balance when you are tweaking them in Photoshop. And uh, So I urge everyone to take a look. Uh, my next video, we're going to be doing... Uh, we're going to be showing how to process pictures to bring to make them good, and uh, and uh, so stay tuned for that. Maybe we'll finish by taking a live video. We're taking a live video of Mars. So I'm turning on the video part of the camera now, and Mars is tiny. So what we what we do is we zoom in. 5x, this is we're going five times closer, and we go 10x. And Mars is red; it's the it's the red planet. And so, uh, but we've got some. Uh, we got it's a little bit overexposed. So we'll go to a hundredth of a second, and we'll turn down the sensitivity. There. So now you can really see in a video what's going on in the atmosphere. Can you see it dance around and jiggle? So he's dancing and jiggling, and that's what the atmosphere is doing to us. And this is what it makes it hard to take pictures, especially if you're taking pictures of planets, is this dancing, bobbing, and weaving makes it very hard to get a decent picture of uh, the moon and planets. But it also hurts pictures of faraway things like galaxies and star clusters and nebulas. And tonight, I was uh, the forecast showed that we were going to have some wind and we're going to have some unsteady skies so you can see this unsteadiness right there but uh, we're not getting any uh, polar caps or detail on uh, mars here i can still a little bit overexposed but we tried a month ago and we weren't able to see much because it's it's pretty far away now look how small it is i mean i'm at maximum mag magnification i got to say that the telescope was not made for this. The telescope was made for deep sky photography, not planets. But it's just kind of cool. That's, that's Mars. And I think that's, the only, I think that's the only planet that's in the sky right now. Yeah, Uranus and Neptune have gone down. And uh, Jupiter and Saturn had their show next to the sun. So they're next to the sun. And I don't see any others. Um, it's cool that um, Orion looks like the hunter there with his arm and his uh, shield. But um, Leo is pretty good. So that actually does look like um, a lion. You can see its feet, its torso, tail on the back, head right there. So that's pretty cool. But uh, it's coming up to 1030. So I'm going to... Uh, Urge everybody, if you've got requests for what we want to see next time, in about a month, I'll do another one. It's good to do this in the winter because we can do it before it gets too late. And, uh, and it's clear there, and it's cloudy here. 
So it's a good time to do it. So um, I'll give me some requests on what types of things we want to see next time. So email me, text me, or whatever to tell me what you want to see next time. So um, thank you, everybody, and uh, good night.